I'm so pleased to welcome you to the campus of the University of Maine at Presque Isle. I'm Linda Schott, and I have the distinct pleasure of uh, serving in that role now for several years. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the beginning of this year's Distinguished Lecturer Series, and we're especially delighted to have Senator Susan M. Collins as our first DLS speaker this year. This speaker series has brought a wide array of talent and intellect to our campus and to our community. We've had astronauts and journalists and farmers and adventurers. Um, in fact, Rachel tells me that the, by our best count, Senator Collins is our 98th distinguished lecturer. Bringing these kinds of lecturers to our campus and our community is a very important part of the university's mission. And we're particularly delighted when we can bring a speaker who has roots from Aristic County, as Senator Collins does. I'm sure you all know that she was born and raised up the road in Caribou, and her family, many of whom have joined us here on the front row today, um, has run uh, S.W. Collins, a fifth generation lumber business since 1844. So, you fast forward to today, and we have Senator Susan Collins, who is a key leader in the U.S. Senate. Senator Collins was first elected in 1996, and she has shown distinguished leadership in many areas such as homeland security, national defense, disaster response, education, business development, and health care. She takes her work quite seriously. She has never missed a roll call vote, casting nearly 6,000 consecutive votes. In 2014, Elle Magazine named her as one of the most powerful women in Washington, D.C. She's also been named the Guardian of Small Business by the National Federation of Independent Businesses and has received honors from other groups ranging from the Veterans of Foreign Wars Association to the National School Board Association. And this year, and in this climate, probably the most impressive, Senator Collins was ranked the most bipartisan member of the U.S. Senate in a nonpartisan index done by the Lugar Center and Georgetown University. So the theme of our lecture series this year is disrupting the status quo, and Senator Collins is certainly no stranger to this topic. She's worked for years in Washington, D.C. to facil facilitate bipartisan compromise and reach across the aisle in a practice that is becoming increasingly less common. Today she will deliver a talk, Can an Institutionalist Be a Change Agent? And we certainly look forward to hearing her comments. With that, we're ready to begin. Remember to have your cell phones turned off. Um, and uh, just join me in giving Senator Susan Collins a hearty county, county welcome. Thank you so much, President Shutt. I'm delighted to be here at the University of Maine at Presque Isle, and of course, it's always wonderful to be back home in the county. The great thing about coming to UMPI is all I have to do, as if I don't know the way, uh, is set my GPS to north of ordinary. <laughs> It is a great college with the best college motto that I know of. It's wonderful to look out and see so many of my neighbors and friends and of course family members who have joined us here, here today. And my family all have so many ties to the University of Maine system and to the University of Maine at Presque Isle. My mother, Pat, earned a second degree here in art, and any of those, any of you who have seen her beautiful watercolors know that she had a lot of talent to start with, but she was well taught here. 
And my brothers and father and uh, sisters-in-laws have all been great supporters as well. So I'm very pleased to be here. This time of year, as we approach the potato harvest later this month, I'm reminded of the strong sense of community that makes the county such a special place. We could use more of that sense of community, of the need to work together toward the common good throughout our country, but particularly in Washington, D.C. Now, as your president mentioned, the theme of this year's Distinguished Lecture Series is disrupting the status quo. In ancient times, the phrase status quo was coined to describe the peace treaty between Rome and Carthage that was forged not by a battlefield victory, but by mutual agreement to restore the balance of power that existed before the war. To return to, in the translation from Latin, the way things were. The status quo was the foundation for the rise of the Roman Republic, early democracy, and civil society. In our times, however, the phrase status quo has taken on a decidedly negative connotation. At best, today's status quo suggests a mindless adherence to something that no longer works, or resistance to innovation, opposition to needed change the kind of stagnation that impedes progress. At worst, the term describes a system that is corrupt and self-serving. So how did the status quo evolve from a system that offered both stability and progress to one that seems to block progress and at times to be rigged for the benefit of a favored few. And when disruption of the status quo is necessary, how shall it be done and who shall do it? I shall approach these important questions from my perspective as a United States Senator and ask one of my own. Can someone who reveres the institution of the Senate the status quo, if you will, be an agent for positive change. I'm so honored to represent Maine in the United States Senate, and I'm proud of this great institution's historical role as the world's greatest deliberative body. Based on the genius of our founders, the Senate is an institution that was designed to promote civility, conciliation, and compromise. It is a place designed to protect and to give a fair hearing to minority views and where raw political power is to give way to statesmanship. The Senate is often referred to as the club but I prefer to think of it as a diverse community where leaders are supposed to work together for the common good. That is the ideal that we have seen carried out by the great senators of the past, like Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, or Arthur Vandenberg. It is an ideal that we have embraced here in Maine by sending thoughtful and respected leaders to Washington, like Margaret J. Smith, Edmund Muskie, Bill Cohen, George Mitchell, and Olympia Snow. As our first president, George Washington, said, the Senate is supposed to be the cooling saucer for the hot tea of political passions. In the 18 years that I've been honored to serve in the Senate, however, I've witnessed a withering of this culture. 
Ideology and excessive partisanship dictate far too much of the conduct. Obstructionism is often employed for its own sake. Base motives are imputed to reasonable differences in policy, causing legitimate differences to evolve into bitter personal disputes. That cooling saucer that George Washington talked about more and more resembles an overheated skillet. <laughs> I believe in the Senate as an institution. Like all institutions, it's a collection of individuals, a hundred in our case, each with our own backgrounds, experiences, interests, and passions. At its best, these personalities work together for the good of our nation because Senate traditions, rules that guarantee open debate, clearly defined procedures for offering amendments, and respectful debate reinforced by a rule that prohibits attacking another senator's integrity on the Senate floor are supposed to produce results. When either party tramples on the rights of the minority, that carefully constructed framework is undermined. And when the president usurps the role of Congress by overreaching in his use of executive orders or by avoiding the Senate confirmation process through recess appointments, the balance of power enshrined in our Constitution is undermined. These traditions are based on one central principle, that democracy is achieved through a deliberative process, not through shortcuts, insults, and manipulation. No matter how noble the policy goal, no matter how frustrating the process, that is the way our system is supposed to work. Yet the Senate, like so many institutions in our society today, is broken. Despite some encouraging signs of progress during this past year, in the Senate's operations and achievements, the far left and the far right still make most of the noise, grab the headlines and the attention, but in reality accomplish very little. Little wonder then that polls show that the public's trust in America's most important public institutions is at all-time lows. And Congress is the lowest of them all. In fact, one poll showed that Congress's approval rate was lower than colonoscopies and root canals. <laughs> and at least with those, you get an anesthetic. <laughs> so, we are paying a steep price for forsaking the principles that guide our institutions. That point was wonderfully made in an essay a few years ago by former Congressman Lee Hamilton of Indiana. In 2004, I had the privilege of working closely with Lee when he was the co-chair of the commission that looked into the attacks on our country on 9-11-2001, and I was serving as chairman of the Senate Homeland Security Committee. Our work together produced the landmark Intelligence Reform Act that has helped to prevent another 9-11. Congressman Hamilton's essay is entitled why Congress needs institutionalists. At a time when Washington seems consumed by gridlock 
and hyperpartisanship and ever more distant from the people it is intended to serve, former Congressman Hamilton provides a striking answer to the question of whether institutionalists can be agents for change. Consider his greatly abbreviated scorecard of what past Congresses have accomplished of the extraordinarily positive change brought about when Congress carries out its constitutional responsibilities. They include land-grant colleges, the GI Bill, the interstate highway system, the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, Medicare, Medicaid, the list goes on and on. It is telling that the institutionalists dominate the scorecard for getting things done, yet the insurrectionists get all the headlines. Let me give you an example. In February of 1950, Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin gave one of the most infamous speeches in history. His speech was a tirade of baseless accusations, fear-mongering, and name-calling. His intent was to stifle our freedoms and to turn Americans against each other. But on June 1st of that year, Maine Senator Margaret J. Smith went to the Senate floor to deliver her famous Declaration of Conscience. She did not do so to demonize Senator McCarthy as a person, as tempting as that must have been, but instead to denounce his actions. She spoke the truth about his tactics of ruining reputations, crushing free speech, and smearing his opponents. Just as important, when she condemned the accusations of communists, fascists, flying around the Senate chamber, she spoke to members on both sides of the aisle. It was an incredibly bold and courageous speech that resonated with the American people and helped to bring the Senate back to its senses and to its principles as an institution. Americans once again felt the touch of what President Lincoln referred to as the better angels of our nature. History has judged those two approaches and declared a clear winner. In 1950, Senator McCarthy was a household name whereas Senator Smith was a freshman and largely unknown senator from the great state of Maine. Today, Senator Smith is revered as a model of leadership who left a remarkable record of accomplishment, while Senator McCarthy is but a sad chapter in our history who left only a scar. I mentioned earlier my work on the Intelligence Reform Act. Let me elaborate. That difficult, sweeping legislation that reorganized 22 different agencies was written, debated, and passed in the midst of a highly contentious presidential campaign year. It was subject to some 300 amendments all of which were given full consideration. And in the end, it prevailed in the Senate by a vote of 96 to 2. My great partner in that endeavor, Senator Joe Lieberman, and I succeeded not by strong arming or trying to squeeze out or stifle the opposition, but by carefully considering all points of view defending our bill, 
modifying it in some cases. In other words, by honoring the traditions of the Senate. The power of time-honored legislative traditions was also clear in our efforts to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 2010. I joined Senator Lieberman in leading the fight to repeal this law that prohibited patriotic gay and lesbian Americans from serving in our military unless they concealed their sexual orientation. My view was that we ought to be expressing our gratitude for their willingness to serve and risk their lives for our country, not drumming them out of the armed forces. Now keep in mind that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was signed into law by a Democratic president, President Bill Clinton, in 1993, and it enjoyed bipartisan support for many years. But times change. Discrimination was the status quo in that law, and it needed to be disrupted. The change in the status quo would be difficult and was going to require Republican and Democratic votes, as well as the change in the military's culture. Although it was just five years ago, outright repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was still very controversial in 2010. For example, while our nation's highest military officer, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, testified in favor of repeal, the Commandant of the Marine Corps was strongly opposed. After a contentious debate in May of that year, the Senate Armed Services Committee, on which I served, voted 16 to 13 to include repeal in the defense policy bill. Not exactly an overwhelming vote. At the time in committee, I was the only Republican to support repeal. But I was optimistic that ultimately, I could convince other Republicans to join me, and they did. In December of that year, during the final days of the legislative session, the giant defense bill, which included the repeal provisions, was brought up on the Senate floor. Disagreement over whether or not there should be amendments and how many stalled the bill and almost killed repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We appeared to be stymied. Senator Lieberman and I talked about how to respond to this big setback. We decided we would introduce a separate, independent, bipartisan, freestanding bill to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. But the clock was ticking. And we were worried about how we could get our bill brought to the Senate floor before the Congress adjourned for the year. That weekend, the assistant leader from the House, Steady Hoyer, called me. He proposed that the House, which was then under Democratic control, would pass a separate repeal bill, but he wanted a guarantee from me that I could deliver a sufficient number of Republican votes in order to pass it in the Senate. I told him I thought we could. And for the next 10 days, I worked night and day to round up Republican votes, even as the clock on the 111th Congress ran down. Many people thought that ours was an impossible task. But Senator Lieberman and I made the case persistently one-on-one -on -one to our colleagues that in this case, the status quo was wrong. When the Senate clerk began to read the roll on our bill, I was both anxious yet confident that the Republican votes needed to put the bill over the top were there, and they were. 
The final roll call on December 20th was 65 to 31, and history was made when the bill was signed into law two days later. My point is that as with the civil rights legislation 50 years ago, without bipartisan leadership and without the votes of members of both parties, don't ask, don't tell, would not have been repealed that year. And because there was bipartisan support, and the support from our nation's chief military officer, there has not been any serious attempt to delay or turn back the clock on repeal. The institutional traditions of Congress won the day. A clear example of the damage caused by ideological polarization occurred about two years ago and was once again resolved by the power of bipartisan compromise. On October 1st, 2013, a government shutdown began because Congress and the Obama administration failed to reach an agreement to fund the federal government for the new fiscal year. It's estimated that the 16-day shutdown cost the American economy $24 billion. Most of all, it cost us in Congress the trust of the American people. Hardworking people in Maine paid a high price for Washington's hyperpartisanship. Small businesses such as the inns, the gift shops, and the restaurants around Acadia National Park lost some $16 million, about a million dollars a day, due to the closure of the park during the peak fall foliage season. Now that hurt not just the business owners, it hurt the housekeepers, the wait staff, the store clerks, and that was income that was lost forever. On Saturday, October 5th, as the shutdown ended its first week, I was all alone in my Senate office because my staff had been completely furloughed, and I was listening to the highly partisan debate on the Senate floor. The debate, if you can call it that, consisted of a Democratic senator coming to the floor and giving a highly partisan speech, followed by a Republican senator doing the same thing, each pointing the finger of blame at the other side, and no one offering a solution. Well, finally, I could not stand it any longer. I thought, this must stop. I drafted a plan I believed that both parties could live with, rushed over to the Senate floor, and implored my colleagues to work to end the impasse. I challenged both sides to come out of their partisan corners, stop fighting, and start legislating in a manner that was worthy of the people of this great nation. Well, no sooner did I leave the Senate floor than my cell phone started ringing. First to call was Lisa Murkowski of Alaska who said, Count me in, I want to help in any way possible. The second person to call me was Kelly Ayotte from New Hampshire with much the same message. The third was Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota who also offered to help. Now the discerning people in this room will see that there is a pattern here. Yes. The women of the Senate led the way. I will quickly add that we also attracted a few good men to help us out. Very quickly, I was leading a bipartisan group of seven Republicans, six Democrats, and one Independent, my main colleague, Angus King.
We worked night and day to come up with a compromise to reopen government. Reaching across party lines, we broke through the partisan impasse. Instead of finger pointing and blame fixing, we actually offered a solution. It showed that the two parties could come together, negotiate, and reach an agreement in an atmosphere of mutual respect and good faith. I call our bipartisan group the Common Sense Coalition, and we continue to seek solutions across the partisan divide. In fact, we had a meeting right before we broke for August, and because I'm very worried about what's going to happen this month before the fiscal year begins on October 1st. Compromise is difficult, but governing without it in a democracy is impossible. Rather than producing a second best solution, a bipartisan approach reached by honest debate and consideration of alternative viewpoints very often is not just the one with the best chance of prevailing, it's often the best solution. Often what makes a policy issue challenging to resolve is that there are valid arguments and concerns on both sides. In such cases, the optimal resolution accommodates the concerns of the opposing sides to the greatest extent possible. The examples that I have provided, I hope will underscore this crucial point. Unyielding adherence to an extreme position is easy. It is the hard work of bringing people together to find common ground that requires determination, intellect, and courage. One can believe in our institutions, in a philosophy, in principles, and be passionate about the positive change, justice, opportunity, and progress that they can produce. This works best, however, when we work together, when we apply that sense of community, of working to achieve common goals that I learned right here growing up in Aroostook County. Thank you. Wow. Voted against the motion to proceed to the bill. 
and that then it couldn't be considered. Now, what the Democrats are arguing is that we need an umbrella agreement on the budget before they will consider any of the individual bills. That worries me because if you look at what is going to happen in September, we have the debate on the agreement with Iran. The Pope is coming to visit Washington, so we have a joint session for that. And there really are very few days before October 1st and the start of the new fiscal year. So number one, and that's why I convened our group before we broke for the August recess, is to avoid government shutdown. I also have many priorities that are included in appropriations bills. I believe that we need a major investment in biomedical research in this country and that we cannot fall behind. It, the studies show that for every two dollars we invest and for every dollar we invest in biomedical research, there's a $2 return at least. I, so I'm working for that and we do have an increase in biomedical research that is in one of the bills. I'm a strong supporter of Pell Grants and there is an increase in funding, a modest increase in funding for Pell Grants that I want to protect that are so important to families in our state in particular. And I know that from not only talking to the University of Maine system, but my time working at Hudson College, uh, now Hudson University, they correct me every time. <laughs> and uh, so that is another uh, priority of mine. Transportation. Uh, we passed a short-term transportation bill because the Highway Trust Fund has run out of money again, and that expires October 29th. We can't keep doing the short-term funding of transportation. Our, I'm glad to see Prescott's Main Street looks a lot better than it did when I was here a month ago. Uh, but you know, I go all over the state. We have bridges that are structurally deficient and are posted and dangerous and impeding the flow of products and people. And for a state that uh, needs to ship products out, whether they're potatoes or manufactured products, and needs to have people coming in for tur tourism, uh, our crumbling infrastructure is a real problem. So we need a long-term highway bill. The Senate passed a three-year it's a six-year bill of which three years are funded. The House passed one that only goes to October 29th. And so we're going to have to resolve that very shortly. And that is very high on my list. A cybersecurity bill is very high on my list. Every single day, it seems, we hear of another breach in either the public sector or the private sector. I'm one of the millions of Americans whose data was stolen in the OPM breach in Washington, where some 21 million Americans had highly sensitive information stolen. Any of us who filled out forms for security clearances. I bet most people in this room have had to have a credit card replaced because they've gone to a retailer who is breached. Our banks are being breached. Uh, the, it's happening from rogue nations. It's happening from Russia, China, and Iran, as well as international criminal gangs and, and hacktivists. And we could do much more to protect our computer networks than we are doing now. But there needs to be legislation in that area. I'll tell you what most worries me is an attack on our critical infrastructure. By that I mean our electric grid, our water supplies, um, our air traffic control system. Imagine if somebody took that over. Uh, think, think how awful it is when we in Maine lose our electricity for a couple of days in the winter. Well, think what would happen if 
deliberately an adversary of the United States took out the electric grid on the East Coast. Think what it would do. There would be deaths, there would be destruction, it would ruin the economy. So that is um, a priority as well. Um, there's so many I could go on and on, but nobody would get to answer any other questions, so I will stop. Yes, ma'am, please identify yourself. Sure. My name is Dawn Goff. I'm a second year student here at UMPI, non-traditional student, um, an English major, and um, going for photojournalism eventually. Um, my question though is, my husband and I relocated our family up here in 2002. Uh, we lived in Lakehurst, New Jersey uh, during the September 11th attacks and we were first responders to Ground Zero and in Staten Island. My concern is that the Droga Act is up for uh, vote again, and we're concerned that it's not going to get passed, and what's going to happen to the medical monitoring program that Dr. Yudizin is so passionate about, and what's going to happen to the workers and everybody that served for the cleanup. First of all, let me thank you and your husband for responding to the worst terrorist attack on our soil in our history. And I have such huge admiration for our first responders, for our firefighters, our police officers, our EMTs who rushed to the rescue, even though so many of them lost their lives as well. I'm very familiar with the bill, that the law that you're talking about. For those of you who are not, uh, we passed the legislation that ensures that first responders who are at the scene continue to receive medical monitoring, uh, treatment, help, because a lot of them are coming down with cancers and other illnesses that are the direct result, or appear to be the direct result of the exposure to toxic fumes and smoke and chemicals on 9-11. I am pleased to tell you I am a co-sponsor of the bill to extend the law. We have an obligation to not forget those who came to the rescue that day. That's reassuring. Thank you. Another question? Yes, sir. Thank you for coming, Senator. Um, Thomas Cooney, who was Vice Chair of the FDIC, said back in April that U.S. banks are disastrously undercapitalized. And I'm wondering, in lieu of that and other insights by other financial experts, if you would co-sponsor S. Senate 1709, that's Glass Steagall for the 21st century. Angus King, um, Elizabeth Warren's bill, um, Cantor is on there, and Bernie Sanders recently, and uh, of course, uh, John McCain. So I'm wondering if you would be a co-sponsor of that bill. I am not a co-sponsor of that bill. What that bill would do is put back, for those who are less familiar with it than you are, would put back into place the Glass-Steagall Act um, that separated commercial banking from investment banking. A better approach, which I offered and was accepted as part of the Dodd-Frank law, um, which I supported despite the fact it's had some unintended bad <coughs> consequences for small community banks, which I'm trying to fix as well, but uh, that set capital standards for significant financial institutions. And if you look back at the calamitous uh, financial collapse in 2008, what you will find is that companies like Bear Stearns were hugely over leveraged, I mean 30 to 1 ratios. And 
They did not have the capital to back up the risky bets that they were making in the market, whether it was dealing with um, securitized mortgages that were bad mortgages, or whether it was engaged in uh, derivatives. Um, they did not have the capital to support that kind of activity. So at the time the bill was on the floor, I met with Sheila Baer, who was the head of the FDIC at the time. And I had spent five years in state government overseeing financial regulation. So I said to Sheila, rather than our trying to figure out exactly what every financial institution should or should not do, isn't the real issue making sure that they have the capital necessary so if they take the risky bet, they've got the capital necessary to prevent a collapse of the institution and a bailout. We should have no more bailouts, period. And that, she said to me that that was exactly right, and she helped me draft this provision, which made it into the final law, that establishes capital standards. And it has been very controversial, I will tell you. The very large financial institutions on Wall Street do not like it. They liked playing more of the gambler's game. But I think if you're going to be backed up by the FDIC and a federal guarantee, uh, you shouldn't be playing the gambler's game. But I think the answer, rather, I think it would be very complicated to try to go back to the days of Glass-Steagall. And I think the better approach, in my judgment, is to have capital standards. And we're working internationally. Um, they're called the Basel standards. Um, it would, so even if it's a financial institution like Barclays or UBS that is, um, that is originates overseas but does substantial work in the United States, it would be covered. And I think that's a, a better approach. We have time for one more question. Or no more questions. That's good. <laughs> oh, there's one. Thank you for coming here today, Senator Collins. I would also like to thank you for taking the time to write to me back in, I believe, April about the BATF ban on green tip ammunition, which was, I believe, eight, XM885. I'm not going to talk about ballistics with you. So. Um, I just wanted to see if you would maybe make uh, abolishing the ATF or the, the ban of 1986 on your agenda at some point. I don't think that we can abolish uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And I said, I spelled those out so that people would know that it's more than just firearms that, w that we're talking about. But I am concerned when I hear a very heavy-handed tactics by some of the agents, and there is no place for that to occur. Thank you. Let us all give Senator Collins another round of applause.